Welcome to Power Lunch Live. I'm Rhett Power, your host. Good to be with you here. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a great conversation today about uh, problem solving and uh, fast problem solving, which I think is going to be really fascinating and a method and a process uh, and that you can use in your business to, to do that. Um, anyway, it's good to be with you. The point of Power Lunch Live is to have today's thought leaders, best-selling authors, people who are doing amazing work in the world that we can learn from uh, and to get better at what we do. And we, we do this on uh, LinkedIn Live. We do it on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, uh, Twitch, I think, and probably something else. But we monitor those platforms during the show. If you send in your question, uh, we'll tr we try to get it to our guest so that uh, they can get to the answers you need. Uh, now, today, it's it's a real pleasure to have uh, da David Kamlas on. Uh, from Syntegrity. He's the CEO of Syntegrity. He's an author, speaker, uh, early stage investor. He's an advisor to top uh, leaders on fast problem solving and mobilization. Uh, he's written for HBR, Wall Street Journal, uh, chief executive, and has been a guest on lots of the leading uh, programs uh, and, and is a contributor writer for Forbes. Uh, he's a co-contributor. We, we both contribute there. Contribute there. So uh, his book, Cracking Complexity, I think opens a new light on the uh, on the topic of solving problems. Uh, David, welcome. Great to be here, Brett. Thanks for that great introduction. Well, you're welcome, and, and it's good to have you. Because I think you know, and we we are living in a in a really complex world and and in a complex business environment. Um, and you talk a lot about complexity when you when you think of complexity and and what people are dealing with now, what, what does that mean to you? And, and, uh, and in a sense, one of the things I, I found interesting in, in your work is uh, you talk about how we're doing it in, in a lot of ways, we're approaching this complexity in the wrong way. Yeah, absolutely. And the reason I can say that we're approaching complexity in the wrong way is because um, there's other kinds of challenges too that exist. And we mm -hmm. get mixed up in in the approaches, I think, that that fit for one kind of challenge, but not another. Um, Dave Snowden and his Kinevin framework are very instructive here, Rhett, mm -hmm. in that um, he talks about different kinds of challenges, simple ones, which you know you solve based on the facts, even if you've never encountered that kind of a challenge, you just figure it out yourself. Mm -hmm. Complicated challenges, which are tricky, especially for non-experts, like if you're putting in a new accounting system or if your car breaks down, that's a complicated challenge. Those are linear challenges that have checklists and lots of experts to do for you what they've done for others. These are solved problems. You just go to the experts, right? Right. Um, when it comes to complex challenges, like how do we deal with the opioid epidemic? How do we address sexual assault on campus? How do we grow faster as an organization? How do we innovate? How do we take out cost more sustainably? How do we lead in the customer experience? How do we merge better? Those are all complex challenges, which means lots of moving parts, not static parts, lots of dynamics, lots of people involved, well, and they need, to right. be, they need to be solved fresh each time. So that's different than a complicated challenge where you may have never seen it, but it's been solved many, many times, and you can just hire the experts. Complex challenges require a diversity of talent to be brought to bear in order to solve them. And I don't think we approach that need for a diversity of talent and knowledge and experience and, and perspective very well. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. And, and I like this idea that that these what, what you're not saying is that there's a cookie cutter approach to, I'm, I'm actually working on a, on a big integration program right now and, and um, a, a merger and you know, the inclination initially was, well, let's just bring in one of the big four to, you know, come in and, and you help us do this, right? They've, they've got an approach. They have an approach that's worked at such and such and such and such. And that, that just doesn't, that doesn't work today, does it? Not entirely. No, it, it certainly doesn't, especially with change initiatives. Like post-merger integration is about two or more cultures coming together for the first time. 
uh, people who are used to being the big fish in yeah. a small pond becoming the smaller fish in a big pond, different dynamics, different uh, aspirations, different ways of doing work. And to have consulting firms come in, um, you know, and apply the same model, which is an interview based analytical mm -hmm. model to these kinds of human dimensions and, and challenges doesn't really get to you to the end of task. There's a lot of stuff that it does that's good, financial analysis, looking at synergies, looking at the lift that's available, looking at all that good stuff. But at the end of the day, human to human interaction needs to be done in a different way than you know um, interviews and hoping that people buy into the synthesized recommendations of very smart people. It needs something more. And so, yeah, they don't get yeah. the job done entirely on those kinds of things. Someone said the word listening tour the other two, day to me and that uh, my head just about exploded because you're not going to, a listening tour is not going to make this integration work, right? Yeah, listening uh, tour is going to really inform the person who's doing all the listening, but not all the people who are doing the talking. Right. Um, and, I, and I actually wonder what you actually get from a listening tour, honestly. I mean, do you, do you in, a, in a group of 50 people, do you really get the truth? You know, do you really get, you get the washed, whitewashed version of it. You get the washed, you know, the clean version of it, right? You do, unless you engineer some sort of approach to getting people to open up and be very disarmed in the presence of many more people, which by the way is imperative when you're trying to solve something big, you need lots of people. But if you just throw them into a conversation or an interview, many of them are not gonna speak from the heart. And I imagine your process gets to that, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, so, you know, I what, what I find interesting is that this is um, the foundational sort of foundation behind this was Ashby's law and the law of, re of requisite variety. But can you talk about the formula that you have for solving these big challenges and with speed and agility? Um, I, I, I think we're all going through because of COVID and, and this, everything that's sort of gone on in the last year, we've gone through a lot of change and we've gone through and we're getting ready to go through it again, right? As, as business opens up in some places and we get back to whatever that new normal is. Um, companies are going through this transition. They're going through this big change. Yeah. Uh, how, well, talk, talk about the book and talk about the, 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 the ideas and the and the principles behind this system. You mentioned Ross Ashby's law of requisite variety. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I deal with, and I'm fortunate to have discovered this stuff from some of the key scientists over the last 150 years, right? Yeah. Standing on their shoulders. Um, this is all about universal truths and first principles. So it's really boiling down the essence of what's really going on to these first principles. And we've, um, you know, baked our formula based on these first principles. So that's really important because you can really make a dent in the universe when you get down to first principles. So one of the first principles is requisite variety, which says mm -hmm. only variety can absorb variety. Mm -hmm. Only variety can destroy variety. What does that mean? So you're dealing with a high variety challenge like transformation, like coming out of COVID and hitting the ground running, changing your business model, customers' habits have changed. How do you address all that new variety? How do you address all those pieces when your competition is trying to address those pieces at the same time? Right. Who gets there first? If you're a government leader, how do you serve citizens whose lives have been impacted dramatically and quickly by the pandemic? There's a lot of moving parts. The only way to address those moving parts is to bring to bear an equal amount of variety on the challenge and the way you do that is by tapping into a diversity of knowledge and information and experience and overall talent and influence and combine it all and bring it together to address the complexities of the environment that you're faced with. Our book, our formula is all about how do you engineer the bringing to bear of all that variety on a high variety challenge? How do you engineer a controlled explosion of brain power and emotional commitment 
to solving something and then executing the solution. There's 10 steps in the formula. I won't go through all 10 steps, but basically those 10 steps are designed to engineer a high volume, mm -hmm. high quality, high speed collisions, conversations, interactions in large groups of people. I mean, 20, 30, 40, 50 people who've been convened over video or physically all together all at once. And it lays out the 10 steps that basically if you follow, you can actually engineer those collisions that yield the matching of the variety of the challenge based on the collective intelligence and collective commitment of that group of people who've been carefully chosen. I mean, it sounds like to me that, that there's 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 conflict involved in that um, or debate or how, how does how do you handle what comes out of complexity is often differencing opi different opinions, different thoughts, different directions. How does that handle that? How do, how do you how do you get people sort of focused in on the right course in the right way and and then which I, I, I sort of see is that getting to the right decision, right? You know, if you get to the, what you know is the right call, then you've got to have the believership and the uh, faith that that's the right, you know, you, people have to buy into it. Um, and then there's the whole action, I think, of, of how do you, you know, take action. But how do you get, how, do you, how does it resolve that conflict, that, that natural conflict that's going to be there? Yeah, so we try to generate that natural conflict. We try to accelerate the arrival okay. of that productive friction um, and not have it be like what we talked about earlier when 50 people in a room being interviewed and trying to give the truth. They don't give the truth unless it's engineered, you know, this disarming environment. So what we do to answer your question, Rhett, is um, we start off with, you know, what is the question that this group has been convened to answer? So we phrase the challenge in the form of a question, like what must we do over the next three months to hit the ground running, you know, coming out of COVID? Or what do we have to do over the next two years to become number one in customer experience? Whatever the question is. And then we don't predetermine the agenda. We let the group who's been convened explore what they need to explore. In other words, determine the topics they need to discuss in order to answer the question. And when you don't predetermine the agenda, when you literally bring a group together for a meeting and say, here's the question, but you know, we've, we know what the schedule is, we're gonna be here till the end of the day, but we don't know what we're talking about in order to get after that question. We give them a way to identify six or eight or 10 topics that they think they need to discuss. Just the act of giving them permission, so to speak, and liberty over the agenda, that's where the believership starts to be born. And that's where the buy-in and the alignment, like we own this, is born. Then once they've come up with their topics, let's say six topics of discussion, we don't just throw them into breakout meetings and say, have at it and do your best. We do a few things. So number one, we tell them we're going to have three rounds of meetings on all six topics. So there's going to be an iterative approach to this. We're going to go through one through six, then we're going to do one through six again, and then one through six again. And we're going to fine tune our thinking along the way, right? We're going to diverge before we converge, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't just throw people into a room hoping that they behave well and that they speak their minds and that they don't dominate the conversation. We actually assign them speaking roles, member, critic, and observer. If you're a member of a topic, you and the other members own that topic. And over three rounds of meetings, you're trying to advance that topic as far as possible to answer that bigger question around mm -hmm. how you're going to lead in customer experience. If you're a critic, you're forced to listen for the first 15 minutes of a 45 minute meeting. And then you're only given a minute to provide your critique on what the members could be doing better to get to okay. end of task, right? And then if you're an observer, you're playing a very frustrating role, which is you can only listen. Now, everyone gets to play those roles on different teams. So if I'm an observer listening for 45 minutes, I'm going off to the other team as a member or as a critic and vice versa. 
When you bring that group of people together and go through three rounds of meetings as members, critics, and observers on topics they care about in order to answer the question, that's where the cross-pollination happens. That's where the disarmed contributions happen. That's where the different kinds of listening mm -hmm. happens. And it yields a really good outcome really quickly. Does that answer your question? It does. No, it's fascinating. I mean, that's a, that's a way different approach, right, to um, it, it, sort of forcing and not forcing that's not the right word for facilitating this kind of this kind of dialogue um what you know when you you say in the in the 10-step process so in that meeting how do you how do you get to because you talk about solving some of these complex things in, in a matter of a couple of days is this so once you go through this stage mm -hmm. what happens now what's the what's what's the next for that what ha what happens next Coming out of a two-day session or over video, a five-day session that's not consecutive hours, yeah. right? It's done over five days, let's say. You have a, a group of 20, 30, 40, 50 people who have said, they've answered the question, these are the things mm -hmm. we have to do in order to lead in customer experience. And here's, you know, how it all, you know, comes together um, in, a plan, in, a, in a plan or a strategy. What's next is we take a smaller core team of decision makers and we get them to make some final decisions. So they've given the group, the larger group, they've given them discussion rights. They've retained decision rights to just put the final, you know, signature on the plan, the budget, the investment. Mm -hmm. Just have a small short meeting with them to, to do that because ultimately the, the best thinking of that broader group with which that, core team has been involved in shaping the recommendations and the strategies and the actions, they don't need a lot of time to massage that. Once you get the collective thinking and co-creation power of the larger group, really concentrated like a magnifying glass, concentrates the energy of the sun on the, you know answering this question, there's not a lot of finessing to do afterwards, but there's a next step of finessing and then there's launching into execution. And the nice thing is these decision makers have a group of 20, 30, 40, 50 key influencers, key stakeholders, key movers and shakers who've been carefully convened and contributed to you know, the solution, all bought in and ready to hit the ground running. Okay, wow, yeah. okay, that's, uh, that's fascinating. What it, uh, I know we, we're not gonna cover all, of the, all 10 of the, of the steps, but talk about some of the other steps that you think are critical to, to making this sort of process successful? Sure, I'll talk about, um, you know, I'll talk about eliminating the noise. Okay. Which is one of the steps. And I'll also talk about how we really engineer collisions because I don't want the word engineer just hanging out there with you, Rhett, sort yeah. of as a buzzword. Right. So eliminating the noise um, and the cost of codification, it's an important concept to wrap people's heads around when you're going to bring together a diverse group of people, they don't speak the same language. Even if they all speak English or Spanish or Portuguese right. or whatever, they, they don't all speak the same language. As you know, they come from different walks of life, different lived experience, different subject matter expertise, right? If you're going to get a group of marketers together, there's not a lot of lost in translation. If you're getting a lot of sales professionals together, they all speak the same language. But once you bring this group of people together to solve something that can only be solved by a diversity of talent, you first have to pay a tax that we call the cost of codification. And really, the, we want to accelerate this cost of codification to not take many, many, many hours or days until these people start understanding what each other is saying and not talking past each other. So what we do is we think very carefully um, once we know who's being brought together to solve the question, what is the level setting material, including the glossary of items and the terminology that these people might use? How do we level set people so that when we bring them together, we've started to pay down that cost of codification, right? Yeah. That's not yeah. earth shattering. And people do this before workshops and meetings all the time. <clears throat> But the cost of codification challenge can maybe inform people's thinking, what else do I have to put in front of this diverse group of people before I even have them come together to talk together that will make it easier for them to start understanding each other sooner? Okay. So that's the cost of codification and eliminating the noise, really good pre-reads that really focus people in on starting to understand what really matters and what is sort of superfluous. 
That's, that's a step. That's a hard. I mean, it, it's. I understand exactly what you're saying, but I think it's a step we often miss, isn't it? I mean, that that's that's something I don't think we do very well often. Correct. Yeah, not everybody, right? And and you know, unless you've heard of the need to do this and the need to think about like the breadth of variety that you need to yeah. bring together or the degree to which you have to eliminate the noise or level set people to speak, you know, the same language, people give it their best shot, but they may not give it the full shot, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what is partly called out in our formula and in the book, Cracking Complexity. And then the notion, Rhett, of engineering these collisions. When we say engineer, um, and it, it's not necessarily straightforward to do, you have to use an Excel spreadsheet, we use an algorithm. Um, when we talk about engineering collisions, well, when you go back to requisite variety, let's say the right variety of people to solve your customer experience challenge or your merger opportunity, let's say that's 30 people. We're going to bring together two people from Accenture, one person from McKinsey, 26 people from the companies that are coming together in this merger from various levels. So we have the right variety of people, including some external experts to inform our thinking. Now, if you bring those people together, you don't want five of them to connect really, really well and the other 25 to check out for a variety of reasons. And even if they're all really gung-ho and contributing, you don't want content not meeting content. You don't want people to not meet one another in the course of these deliberations. And so when you bring 30 people together, you have to account for 30 times 29 connection points. If you bring 40 people together, you need to account for 40 times 39 connection points. And so if you pay attention to the collision points of these people, these intersection points, then you can assign them to teams that not only put them on the right teams based on their subject matter expertise, but also builds in the cross-pollination that you need by having everyone meet everyone in the course of these deliberations and not leave that to chance. So next time when you, your listeners more importantly, are convening meetings of you know, more than eight, nine, 10 people, you know, whether they're doing it scientifically or whether they're doing you know, a little bit of art applied to this, think about how am I colliding everyone, not just a subset of those people, how am I making sure everyone talks to everyone? Yeah, no, I, that's actually really smart. And again, not something uh, I think we all, all often think of, but um, putting some thought behind, you know, how you do that, and how you design that, I think is, is really, really important. Um, how do you, and, and I, I can see sort of the answer to my question. Um, how do you, because this is such a different approach, how do you get team buy-in and how do you how does how does that from your experience in working with this process uh how do you get leadership buy-in on this the, to do the, it? yeah to do it in the first place yeah well our so we've been doing this for about 20 years um okay. you just asked the hundred million dollar question so to speak <laughs> sorry about um, that but. you know how do you get leaders to buy in well not every leader is going to buy in and, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of next level leadership, right? And we've worked with a lot of leaders who've bought in, obviously, over the last 20 years, we've done over a 1000 projects, right? And multiple leaders who really turn to this, there's other leaders who just don't want to do this. Maybe the better question, then, I guess I, I get that, um, is what are the characteristics of leaders who look at this and say, this is brilliant? I mean, like, what are what? What, are, what characteristics do you find characteristics do you find in those leaders? How about that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, these are leaders who understand that complex challenges can only be solved through you know many diverse perspectives being brought to bear. It's leaders who are typically in accountable positions where they really are um, you know leading the charge on the companies or the government departments top challenges. If you combine those two characteristics, I'm in charge of the defining challenges of my department or my company. I'm a CEO, I'm a head of a country, you know, et cetera. 
And I understand that the answers lie within many people, not in any small group of people. Those are the ideal candidates to turn to this and go, okay, I get what you're saying. You know, your sort of science brought to collisions around diversity of talent. They buy in very quickly because they have to, because they don't have time on their side. A lot of people who aren't necessarily dealing with the most pressing challenges their company or their team is faced with, um, and or who don't necessarily believe in the power and the potential of larger groups of talent contributing to solve challenges. They want to handle these right. with small deliberations. They're not going to buy in so readily. So one of the things I, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by here is I'm on this uh, TV show coming up um, in the fall and uh, we're going to film it in, in, in June. And the, and the premise of the show is we have four days to take the UN development goals and, and uh, they're going to assign us one of the UN development goals, um, you know, ending poverty, ending, I mean, you know, eradicating cancer, uh, solving, you know, uh, uh, some of the, those big, those big issues. Um, I see that. And, and we've got a, bring a team together that doesn't know each other, mm. that doesn't speak the same lang language as you talked about. Um, and I was just thinking about this process. This is brilliant to help kind of, we have to come up with a business plan to solve, to create a business in four days to solve that issue, right? Um, this this is perfect for that. And I've been thinking about how do, how do we, how do we bring a team together to do this in such a short period of time? Um, I'm used to creating a business plan, but not in four days and not not set on such a massive scale. Right. So I, I may need to um, have more conversation. I need to have more conversations yeah. about how to do that. Because anytime, that, anytime, man, uh, because this is this is fantastic. Thank you so much for for being on the program today. And I, I you, you got to get this book uh, cracking complexity. It's uh, you can get it at Amazon. Um, I guess people aren't going to bookstores right now, but get it online, uh, get your copy. Uh, cause I think this is a, this is just a, a book. Everybody should, if you're a leader, you should read this. Uh, so David, thank you so much. Been a huge pleasure speaking with you and a privilege. Thank you. Well, I, I, I do want to, uh, have a, have some more discussion with you about this because I love the process. So anyway, thank you for being here today on power lunch, uh, spending some time with us. Again, get a copy of Cracking Complexity. Do you have a copy with you? You have it. You gotta have a copy. I'm gonna show the. Yeah, there it is. Um, I've got the e version. So, uh, get a get get your copy. It's right there. And uh, how can people get in touch with you, David? They can find me on LinkedIn. They can find me at syntegritygroup.com. They can find me at crackingcomplexity.com. And you guys are, you, you do speaking as well. You, you, you'll go into a company and show them how to do this. Uh, so you're, you're out there to help. Absolutely. Help is the right word. Yep. Yeah. Well, thank you. And uh, thank you for spending some time with us. We'll be back next Tuesday, 12 noon Eastern Standard Time. If you want to check out the website that's got this, the upcoming schedule, please do. It's powerlunch.live, powerlunch.live. We'll see you next week.